So I'm very excited to be here today. There's so many familiar faces, uh, and I'm really also excited to talk about this particular topic, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, so as per tradition, we'll start off with a case. This is a 44-year-old woman with obesity, and she comes in with the following symptoms. What might her symptoms be? So I'm hearing some silence because I don't think most of us usually think of symptoms when we think of obesity. Uh, and so we're already a little bit stuck. <laughs> we might think of joint pain or reflux, but the reality is those are comorbidities. Those aren't obesity. Yeah. Uh, I heard one mention of uh, uh, being hungry, but I think part of the reason we get stuck is because we use what is coming to be actually sort of an old-fashioned definition of obesity, which is obesity is a BMI of 30 or higher. Well, yes, that's true, but recently there was a consensus statement released by the Endocrine Society. It was developed by leaders in the field, uh, including our own Mike Schwartz of the Division of Endocrinology. And what they recommended is that we update our definition of obesity to take into account uh, what the recent developments in understanding obesity pathogenesis are. And that is that obesity is a disorder of energy homeostasis, and it's characterized by defense of an elevated level of body fat mass. So the problem is not the weight, but the problem is the fact that once body fat mass becomes higher, the physiologic systems of energy homeostasis defend that higher level of body fat mass, resist weight loss, and promote weight regain. So if we're going to understand this as a disorder of energy homeostasis, let's double back and think about what energy homeostasis actually is. Well, like any endocrine system that we know about, uh, there is a periphery that's being monitored. In this case, it's our energy stores in the form of fat. And it's releasing signals such as insulin and leptin that are going to double back into the brain and uh, provide feedback at the level of the hypothalamus, primarily in the arcuate, but not exclusively in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. The arcuate then will act by a downstream neural pathways in order to alter uh, food intake and energy expenditure and restore energy balance. So what I want to point out in this system is that a lot of the regulation is happening at this point in the cycle. So what's being controlled is our food intake. And our food intake is a behavior. So this is a homeostatic system in which our sense of appetite, the foods that seem appealing to us, and ultimately our behavior in terms of food intake is what is the regulated output. And now you can see how we're creeping towards something that can give us a little bit better idea of how to um, take a history in this regard, how to understand this disorder, um, both in terms of normal appetite processing and in terms of what might go wrong when this system is not working correctly. And so that'll be what hope we'll cover today. And uh, our agenda specifically is as follows. We'll start by talking about how we use a tool of fMRI and visual food cues to study appetite regulation. I'll show you how our genes influence satiety processing at the level of the brain, and I'll give you the evidence accumulated to date that satiety processing is impaired in obesity. We'll talk about a couple of reasons why that might be. You'll note a question mark up there because I think there's some debate uh, to be discussed. Uh, and I'll talk about one potential mechanism, which is hypothalamic gliosis. And finally, we'll wrap it up with our implications for clinical care. So starting off, uh, we use uh, visual food cues to study appetite regulation. And when I think about food intake, I think about the whole process of food intake. So in reality, food intake starts most of the time with identifying food in the environment. It's uh, just a coincidence that I happen to have donuts up here. Um, but what we know is that the brain is uniquely qualified to find food in the environment because we always used to have to find our food uh, through our whole of our mammalian history. And we can identify food within 100 milliseconds as well as distinguish its caloric content. So then the next step in food intake is we have to integrate all of the different inputs regarding our desire to eat. 
So that might be social, psychological factors, could be how long it's been since we've eaten, um, and the kinds of foods we personally find appealing. And then execute the motor actions necessary to acquire and consume that food, reaching onto the donut tray, driving through the drive through or chasing our food, catching it, eating it. Um, once that occurs and you consume the food, there is a cascade of signals that include falls in the orexigenic hormone ghrelin released in the stomach, rises in GLP-1, PYY, and CCK from intestinal sources, as well as the sense of gastric distension. And all of these act via vagal afferents and synapse in what's called the nucleus of the solitary tract, which is in the hindbrain. Also, circulating glucose and insulin will rise, and uh, these act in the hypothalamus as well as other brain areas. Now, what we know from Rodin and other work is that there's quite a bit of crosstalk between the satiety center and the regulatory centers and the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus has um, neurons that kind of turn the volume up and down on these satiety signaling neurons within the hindbrain. Uh, and then each of these areas has direct and indirect pathways to what we call the cortical limbic centers. So the cortical limbic centers are involved in drives, uh, motivation, motivated behavior, uh, as well as uh, our perceptions of reward and the way those rewards are titrated uh, over time. And together, all of these regions have to establish our sense of satiety and feedback in some way in order so that we no longer find the food appealing, we push the plate away, and we can go do something else for a while instead of eat. So we were particularly interested in uh, which uh, identifying brain regions that might be part of this process that's looping back and suppressing our interest in food. So what we use is functional magnetic resonance imaging. So functional magnetic resonance imaging is an indirect measure of neural activity. And it uh, measures activity in response to a stimulus, in this case, images of food. And our images of food are objects, which are our control images, and then two different categories of food, which are based on ratings of whether or not you should try to eat this food when you're trying to lose weight. So we call the group that you uh, should avoid the fattening foods because they have this social context, but they also tend to be highly energetic with high fat and high sugar content. And the other are the non-fattening foods. So here's an example of some of our photos that people would observe in the scanner. So now that you're full of donuts, you might not find this chocolate as appealing as you would have uh, when you first walked in the room. Um, but you can see uh, the various sort of food categories that fall into each of these groups. So one of the first studies we did was looking at what areas of the brain are responding to those really high calorie foods. And remember that fMRI is uh, not quantitative, so we're always comparing the responses to one type of stimulus to the responses to a second. In this case, it's chocolate versus couches. So what we see are brain regions um, that include uh, uh, regions such as the hypothalamus uh, marked there, uh, regions involved in motivated behaviors that are housed in this midbrain, including the ventral tegmental area and the substantia nigra, which house these dopamine neurons that motivate our uh, basic biological drives, the hindbrain satiety areas, uh, the ventral striatum, or nucleus accumbens, which is uh, being signaled to by the VTA, and the insular cortex, which is our primary taste cortex, and also processes our interoceptive cues from the body. So all of these regions govern uh, reward, motivation, and are highly and act, uh, activated by uh, these high-calorie food cues. Then we looked at what areas of the brain respond more to the carrots than the couches. And this is what we found. So you'll notice there are no blue dots in any of the regions that we just talked about. And that's because there wasn't enough difference between looking at a carrot and looking at a couch to these regions that are perceiving reward and motivation. Um, so what we concluded is that these brain areas are selectively attuned to visual images of fattening foods. 
So the next thing we wanted to understand is does this change during the process of satiety? And so we enrolled normal weight men and women who rated their hunger, uh, underwent the fMRI, and then compared uh, specifically their responses to those high calorie foods to the low calorie foods. And what we see is that there are areas of the brain in which how hungry or full you are is directly related to the degree of activation by these specifically high calorie foods. And that includes the amygdala, where there's a positive association, uh, such that people who are rating themselves more hungry have greater activation, or greater difference in activation, rather, between the high and low calorie foods. And when you're full, you actually might have greater activation by those um, non-fattening food cues. So the amygdala uh, is uh, critical for establishing reward cue associations. Um, and then the medial orbital frontal cortex, which is one of the other regions we look at, is involved in those uh, reward cue associations, but also in devaluing those associations during um, uh, times of satiety, for instance. So um, we went on to look at whether this predicted how much food people ate, and it in fact predicted uh, whether uh, people consumed a higher percentage of calories from fat when they went to a buffet meal where they had a choice from a wide variety of foods immediately after their fMRI. So these um, signals that we read from these areas appear to be a, a readout of appetite, and they also uh, are predictive of food choice. So here's our model, um, and uh, we found some of these corticolimbic re regions that do seem to be active in satiety. Uh, and so, but they're specific to high calorie foods. Uh, and uh, you'll see more uh, along that theme as we go. So one of the uh, major goals uh, that we have is trying to understand how genes might be influencing our satiety processing. And part of the reason we thought about this is because of classic studies done by Claude Bouchard and colleagues back in the early 90s. And what they showed is that not only do genes influence their weight, people's weight, but they influence the degree that weight changes in an environment. Uh, and that's part of what we're experiencing in our current uh, obesity epidemic. So they enrolled 12 twin pairs who were overfed by 1,000 calories a day, and they gained weight. And then they looked at how much weight they gained and mapped it out by twin pairs. So what you see here is uh, each dot represents a pair, and you'll see there's a wide variety, individual variety uh, of weights that are gained, but pairs that are closest to this line gained similar amounts of weight. And uh, if you gained 10 kilos, it was very likely that your twin also gained 10 kilos. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what this tells us is that uh, in a situation of overfeeding or a change in the environment, your genes are partly what determine how much weight you gain. So there must be an interaction between our genes and this environmental cues, and we wondered if it was happening at the level of the brain. So we did a study called uh, Brain Regulation of Appetite in Twins. We enrolled twins from the Washington State Twin Registry. This is a study of 21 MZ pairs who came in uh, and had a standardized breakfast that accounted for 10% uh, uh, of their daily needs. Uh, then they, uh, three and a half hours later, they underwent uh, the fMRI scan, uh, followed by another standardized meal that was 20% of their daily caloric needs and a second fMRI. That was immediately followed by a buffet meal where we put them in the room, uh, we said, hey, um, you know, eat whatever you want, and then we surreptitiously monitored what they ate. Um, so remember this, when we're doing a twin study, is looking at the whole genome, which is called polygenic inheritance. So the first thing I wanna show you is the inheritance for BMI, which we had an interclass correlation of 96% in this particular study. You won't see anything that strong the rest of what I show. Um, the next thing I want to show you is the subjective experience of satiety when uh, people uh, eat that standardized meal. So we're looking at the change in hunger that the twins reported between, uh, uh, from before to after eating, and we saw uh, significant inherited influences on both the change in hunger and fullness. What about their food intake? Well, most everybody ate about 50% of their estimated daily caloric needs when they went to the buffet. Um, and that was true whether they were lean, overweight, or obese. It was also true whether they were male or female. And uh, this correlation shows that uh, people who 
eat more tend to eat more, which basically means uh, the people who we gave uh, a higher number of calories to based on their estimated daily needs also tended to eat more at the buffet. But what I want to point out is that there's a good deal of individual variability. And so next we tested whether genetics could be explaining some of that. And we did, again, find that there were significant intraclass correlations where twins were more similar to each other in the number of calories they chose at the buffet uh, than to unrelated individuals. And the same was true if you looked at the percent of daily caloric needs. So let's take a look at the fMRI and see if this is happening at the level of the brain. So what we're including uh, in uh, what we call the extended satiety network are uh, some of these orbital front uh, uh, cortical limbic regions, as well as the insular tapes cortex and the amygdala that we've previously shown are responsive to these food cues. And here we saw that before a meal, there was no baseline similarity in how the twins responded to their uh, images of food. But after a meal, uh, the, the degree of activation, along with the subjective satiety, was more similar among the twins, suggesting an inherited component. And that was especially true when we look at the change in activation. So the degree to which the brain either uh, suppresses or maintains activation by these high-calorie food cues has an inherited component. So once again, when we look at polygenic inheritance, we don't see a baseline level, but the extent of satiety in the brain appears to have an inherited component. So moving on, we wanted to look at single gene mutations and not just polygenic inheritance. And so we were particularly interested in FTO. Uh, this uh, polymorphism uh, provides the strong So we were interested in um, seeing if we could determine uh, whether um, fat mass uh, was related to activation. And this is a second component of our twin study where we enrolled uh, pairs that had at least one obese member uh, in them uh, in order to discern the relative relationship of fat mass versus genetics. On the left, you see an association of the change in brain activation, so again, whether it's suppressed or stays high um, by a meal uh, within our extended satiety network. To the right are individuals with a greater fat mass, and uh, it's a positive association. So those individuals are tending uh, at a, a mild association to have sustained activation. The next thing we did is we used our twins. And what you can do with twins is you can compare them to each other and look at the difference in their fat mass and then compare that to the difference in their outcome. So now you're comparing individuals who share 100% of their genes were of the exact same body type. So we can look at the effect, mass, mass, uh, effect of fat mass independent of those factors. So uh, you'll see this will now be the twin with the greater fat mass and whether or not they have more sustained activation. And here you see no uh, relationship once you compare. So we believe that this is evidence for genetic confounding in some of the studies of obesity, meaning that some of the time we're concluding that actually is and that's been true in several other um, twin studies uh, apart from ours. Well, the next uh, turn I want to take is towards a potential acquired influence on satiety, and this is where I'm going to talk about hypothalamic gliosis. So first of all, uh, what is gliosis? Gliosis is the brain's characteristic response to any form of nerve injury occurs in autoimmune disease, ischemia, um, and uh, it's on the part of several cell types, but includes microglia and astrocytes. So this was the paper uh, did, done with um, colleagues uh, Josh, Shale, Josh Thaler and Mike Schwartz, others in endocrinology, where um, we showed that high-fat diet feeding in rodents rapidly induces an increase in uh, the number and uh, uh, reactive morphology and microglia within the RTA nucleus. So here's 14 days of high-fat feeding. You see how these nice sort of thin microglial cells, uh, the brain macrophages become plumped up and they get these short, stubby little processes consistent with an inflammatory response. After eight months of high-fat diet feeding, we also showed a reduction in the number of POMC cells. 
So these are the primary uh, um, anorexigenic uh, neurons uh, elements that are responding to um, the uh, responding to those leptin signals. So you can see how this has uh, potential significant implications for appetite. Josh and his colleagues, uh, uh, collaborators at UCSF, have gone on to do uh, genetic and knockout studies to demonstrate that these microglial and astrocytic responses are uh, necessary to see the hyperphagia and weight gain in diet-induced obese models. We've been particularly interested in understanding whether this process is occurring in humans, and we are fortunate to have a method of studying this, which is actually structural MRI. Structural MRI is what you're used to seeing in clinical neuroradiology, where you're determining the tissue characteristics based on the degree of brightness or darkness. Uh, and uh, we use a quantitative method where we actually measure that degree of brightness in something called the T2 relaxation time. And we've demonstrated in rodents that this correlates uh, with astrocyte responses. And we also did the following postmortem study in humans to do the same. What I want to show you on this slide um, is uh, the fact that uh, from our GFAP stain that looks at astrocytes, you can see over here in C uh, what uh, the uh, medial basal hypothalamus, the area of the arcuate nucleus, looks like in an individual with a longer T2 relaxation time than dosis. Now look at all these fat, clumped up astrocytes and their clump processes that are sort of wrapping and enveloping these neurons. Uh, and under electron microscopy, it looks like this dense syncytium has formed. Uh, and we know from, uh, from studies of spinal cord injury and other uh, situations where this occurs, that that can impede neurogenesis, uh, which does occur in the hypothalamus, and it can also impede neurite outgrowth. So we know this can have, this structural change could have significant consequences for nerve function. Well, what is the accumulated evidence that this is occurring in obesity? This uh, was also in the Thaler et al. paper that we participated in. This is a clinical retrospective study that was the first evidence uh, for uh, hypothalamic gliosis in obesity in humans. And it showed a positive association between BMI and T2 signal in the MBH. We followed that up with a prospective study that uh, replicated the finding, and since then another group has replicated the finding, uh, and uh, there have been some lateralization in the findings, uh, which was replicated in this particular study as well. One other post-mortem study that's been done uh, compared uh, obese uh, to lean individuals uh, based, uh, and this is staining from microglia within the hypothalamus, and again, you're seeing increased uh, uh, microglial numbers. Uh, they saw uh, uh, microglial dystrophy and a positive association between BMI and the extent of uh, staining from microglia. None of these were present in the cortical uh, control regions. We've gone on to look at whether this is true in children, and this was with a collaboration with Dr. C. Weybricker, who's a pediatric endocrinologist in Brazil. Uh, and uh, what she conducted was a study of obese and lean Brazilian children, where we again showed elevations in T2 relaxation time consistent with gliosis in children that were specific to the medial basal hypothalamus region that houses the arcuate and did not occur in control regions. And she also identified positive correlations with the extent of visceral adiposity as well as android adiposity at DEXA. So this and other regions has us asking some newer questions. So we feel that there is um, considerable evidence accumulating that this is present in obesity, but we wondered whether it could be related to the incidence of comorbid disease uh, in humans. So this is another collaborative study uh, with Dr. Simone van de Sandele, uh, who examined, uh, uh, again in Brazil, who examined uh, three groups of women, uh, obese type two diabetic women, obese non-diabetic women and control, lean controls. And again, showed a significant association where there were elevations in T2 relaxation time that were limited to that medial basal hypothalamus region in the women with diabetes. In our own study, we looked at insulin resistance. Uh, and for this study, we identified individuals who had the strongest evidence for gliosis and compared them to controls. And that was regardless of their weight. So when we do that, we do see higher BMI in these cases, uh, uh, no significant difference in glucose levels, 
but significantly higher fasting insulin and HOMA IR. And uh, this is, uh, if you correct for BMI statistically, these relationships are independent of the elevated adiposity. So uh, another study has uh, not noted uh, a relationship with HOMA IR. So there's definitely still some debate and room to go in this. Fortunately, we actually have a study going on right now to ask this very question. And uh, the uh, objective of this particular study is to establish a relationship between diabetes and uh, glucose intolerance and diabetes. Uh, so uh, if you or someone you know or a patient uh, uh, might be interested in participating in a study like this, um, please grab a flyer or email us. And now we can get back to our regularly scheduled programming uh, after that shameless plug. Uh, so um, we have uh, begun to explore implications of MBH gliosis for satiety processing uh, using some of the fMRI techniques that we've already discussed. So what I'm going to do here is kind of make you harken back to uh, 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 data we talked about earlier. Um, remember when we were comparing those twins to each other uh, and looking at how their difference in fat mass was related to their whether their activation was suppressed by eating? Uh, so now we're looking again at whether um, activation by high calorie food cues is uh, suppressed by eating. But now we're looking at the within pair difference in gliosis and comparing a twin, a twin that has more evidence of gliosis uh, in terms of their activation. And what we see here is a strongly positive association. What this means is that above and beyond your age, sex, and genetics, if you are showing more evidence for gliosis, you are not suppressing that activation by high calorie food cues after a meal, which goes along with feeling more hungry, less full, greater food intake, and more choice of um, high calorie or rather higher fat foods. So um, apart from the relationship to appetite processing, we're also really interested in uh, whether this gliosis is related to that raising of the set point. We haven't yet uh, Got, found a way to test this, but we're very interested in it. But we've started by looking at reversibility. And so we did see that you can reverse these processes by uh, placing rodents back on chow, which is uh, potentially appealing, but not humans. Placing humans on chow doesn't sound like that's going to work. But uh, we, there's one study that showed a lack of reversibility, even by bariatric surgery. It was pretty small. It only had 10 individuals. Um, but working with Dr. Simone Van de Sandely, uh, she brought back those same women who had diabetes and obesity eight months after Ruin Y gastric bypass. And there we actually do see a main effect of surgery to reduce signs of gliosis in the hypothalamus. Uh, and so this provides some data uh, and goes along with the fact that surgery is currently our uh, best shot at getting permanent. Uh, weight loss. So there's more to be done uh, in this regard, but our current model is that uh, hypothalamic gliosis is initiated by diet uh, based on the rodent literature. Uh, there's uh, lots of room to investigate this in humans. We're not certain what the dietary initiators are in humans. In rodents, it's high fat diet feeding, saturated fat, and potentially high fructose. As this high fat feeding becomes chronic, we uh, believe that there is a progression uh, centrally, which may uh, be directly related to uh, the uh, progression of obesity, uh, its uh, permanence, or its progression to uh, comorbidities. So lots more work to be done here. Uh, but let's wrap up this brain section uh, and review what we've learned. So normal meal-induced satiety involves suppressing the subjective appeal as well as the brain response specifically to high-calorie foods in specific brain regions that drive our motivation. This changes food choice and food intake. Our genes influence our level of satiety perception at the level of the brain. And allelic variation in FTO increases food intake, which may be related to a, a failure to suppress corticolimbic responses during satiety and would be consistent with a CNS mechanism, potentially of leptin resistance. 
We believe uh, there's accumulated evidence that hypothalamic gliosis is present in association with obesity in humans, and it has potential implications for satiety processing as well as in the pathogenesis and the persistence of obesity and type 2 diabetes. So we've toured the brain. Let's get back to our case and see what we've learned. I think now we're ready to fill in some of these uh, blanks in our history. So if you go back to this loop of energy homeostasis, you can now kind of fill in what might be uh, uh, apparent uh, in going wrong. So uh, many patients report a sense of hunger. Uh, some patients report they're not hungry. Some report that they don't feel full when they eat. Um, I eat, but then I know I should be full, but I just keep um, having more. They could be more susceptible to external food cues, have a harder time resisting certain foods or experience an increased appeal specifically to high calorie foods in the environment. That uh, we know that there, although I didn't talk a lot about metabolism today, that there's inadequate metabolic compensation for higher energy intake and uh, excess weight gain or difficulty with weight loss. So of the mechanisms we've discussed today, and there are many more that could be touched upon, uh, genetic susceptibility, insulin and leptin resistance, and hypothalamic gliosis. Well, we can do a little bit about insulin resistance, but we have nothing that addresses those other treatments. And so all of the treatments are kind of going to be focused at this other end of the loop. I want to give one caveat to this, which is that uh, most patients, when they're at a stable weight, are in energy balance, meaning that they're maintaining uh, their weight over time. But the problem is that the body is now stimulating food intake sufficient to maintain that higher level of body at a pos. So they may be experiencing no particular symptoms uh, because they're in energy balance, and that's the main issue. All right, what are the clinical uh, implications? So. Taking a history. Uh, first of all, we'll just talk about some words uh, to talk about this issue. Uh, so most patients think the word weight is a little, um, is more non-judgmental than talking about obesity or some of these other things. We usually talk about a patient, uh, talk about your weight. Um, we use phrases like, uh, tell me about your eating habits. Uh, or do you eat three meals a day? Uh, do you feel full when you eat? Uh, do you get hungry? Are you having any cravings? Are there problem foods where you find them difficult to resist? So, and then if patients are reporting reduced satiety, there's a little bit of a differential for that. But one of the common things that we encounter is patients who are chronically restricting their intake. Uh, so they've been dieting for a long time. They eat three peas and a salad. And then, you know, after dinner, they're still hungry and there's chips in the and those are going to be really hard to resist because we talked about how those rational choices get harder, the more motivated you are for high calorie foods. Uh, skipping meals uh, is extremely common uh, among uh, my patients. Uh, and uh, as individuals become more weight reduced, this uh, appetite signals are going to be increasing and are going to tend to also make it uh, harder uh, to follow their healthy lifestyles. We know a lot about the fact that poor sleep influences appetite, uh, and so addressing uh, both sleep disruption and disrupted circadian cycles can be a good behavioral treatment for folks. And finally, there's a long list of medications uh, that interfere with appetite, and I would encourage you to look at this review that was published in, J in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. Um, uh, one of the highlights of which I learned from that was that medicines like gabapentin and sulfonylureas have comparable average weight gains uh, to olanzapine and atypical antipsychotics. Uh, so those are the kinds of medications that we're trying to uh, uh, exchange. Foods and we can guide patients in that regard. So who to treat and what treatment are we going to choose? Well, I actually really like this American Association of Clinical Endocrinologist um, guidelines, and it's pretty dense, so I'm gonna hit the highlights for you. So you're gonna start off uh, looking at the patient's BMI, and then you're gonna look in this row at what comorbidities they have. If a patient is obese with no complications, uh, then they're going to start with the mainstay of therapy, which is lifestyle changes, uh, and, uh, and which we're familiar with. 
Uh, if the patients have tried that on their own and failed, uh, if they're progressing in their weight gain, uh, you could consider adding a medication. And what I would argue that you also take into account the symptoms the patient's experiencing when you decide that there might be a physiologic reason to use the pharmacology. For patients with obesity who have one or more mild to moderate complications, uh, that's not defined, but for me, that's metabolic syndrome or prediabetes, dyslipidemia. Uh, those patients uh, also can be considered to have uh, a weight loss medication after the uh, initial trial of lifestyle, or, or it could be initiated concurrently. And again, I think taking any symptoms into account is a good way to make that decision. And then I want to point out that their recommendation is that any person uh, who meets the criteria for uh, obesity and has at least one severe complication. So for me, diabetes is a pretty severe complication. I think uh, fatty liver disease is a severe and incurable uh, uh, complication. Um, and uh, disabling arthritis or some of the other things we would consider. Those individuals are currently recommended, according to this guideline, to have a weight loss oh. medication initiated at the time. Um, these are also the folks uh, where we're leaning towards a more, uh, our maximal trip therapy that we have available right now, which is bariatric surgery. Um, when we talk about pharmacology, there are now a few options available for long-term use. Um, the most potent one on the market is this combination of phenamine and topiramate. Uh, I have a lot of patients tell me things like, oh my God, I feel like I'm eating like a normal person. I can eat and then I can just push the food away and I'm done. I'm not thinking about food all the time. Uh, so some of these medications can have uh, profound effects uh, on uh, that behavior, which we're trying to alter. So the naltrexone bupropion combination uh, is relatively potent, as is liraglutide, which is our GLP-1 um, agonist. Uh, and uh, lorcaserin and orlosat are a little less potent. This is the subtracted weight loss over. So I think it's actually easier to understand uh, what pharmacology is doing um, based on this um, slide here. So if you look at lifestyle in a study of 550 individuals and you map out each of their individual weight loss, uh, you'll see a very typical average weight loss of about 5%. So most all lifestyle modification studies get that result on average. Uh, there's a bunch of people who gain weight and there's very few that lose a substantial amount of weight. This curve is shifted at the lower dose and shifted even further at the higher dose, such that more people, people on average are getting about that 10% weight loss or even a 10, 15% weight loss at the higher dose. And more people are experiencing larger weight losses. These are on the order of bariatric surgery. So while it's not uh, distinct evidence that one of the things these medications is doing is sort of reversing that elevation of the set point, uh, at minimum, it's making it temporarily uh, uh, lower for the individuals. And so we have yet to determine if that's really um, how it's acting, but uh, I think these data kind of point in that direction. So what are the other clinical implications? We're going to monitor our treatment, and now you know how to ask them about their appetite and some of the symptoms they might be having. And remember that this is uh, the ultimate goal is the behavior. So is it making it easier? to stick to these lifestyle changes that they're, they're implementing at the same time. Um, and to kind of rethink our care for our patients of, of the obesity and put it back into our chronic disease management model. So we're gonna try multiple strategies over time. Uh, we might be escalating our strategies by adding medications. We might be escalating our strategies by going to uh, uh, bariatric surgery at some point. The medications, when they're used, are now recommended to be used long term. Both patients and providers uh, give me a little bit of, uh, don't feel very comfortable with that. I guess what I would say is that when we put patients on blood pressure medications, we don't take them off and expect them to keep their blood pressure down by using willpower. Uh, so it's really the same in this physiologic system, but the regulated output is those patients. So the reason uh, we're in this situation of treating long-term is because we don't have a cure. But I think if we continue to do research onto why this uh, set point becomes more elevated in obesity, we could actually have treatments that look a lot more like cures than what we have now. 
So there are lots of folks to thank, and there's lots of familiar uh, people uh, in the room today, uh, which uh, has made me very happy to feel supported and see this his, my long history reflected uh, here at um, Harborview and the university. So I'd like to thank the folks in my lab that work really hard to make this happen. Uh, my collaborators in radiology, including Ken Miravilla and Tom Grabowski, my collaborators in endocrinology and metabolism, including Josh Thaler and Mike and given me such an exciting opportunity to do this translational research, uh, as well as our uh, folks at Columbia and new collaborators at Hopkins, and the support of general internal medicine that allowed me to branch off into this uh, translational direction. So with that, I'm happy to take some questions. I also appreciate you all spending uh, this hour with me today.